So the game starts off in this theater show. The show's not that important, even though it is very tastefully done. Nice makeup, decent acting, four out of five stars. What is important, though, is that this is a family acting troupe where the lead actor is the son and the manager is this bitch of a mom. Like, this bitch is literal, I will cut you crazy. His pops is cool, though, and is all like, my son, let's go get some pecking duck. What seems to be like a nice meal quickly turns into a total fucking shit show, though, because when little homie gets back from the bathroom, his pops is dead. Like, bop, headshot, dead. I mean, this man wanted some Chinese food, and all he caught was a bullet. Big rips. So now this kid is all fucked up because his mom's a bitch and his pops is dead, but he ends up becoming Masumi Arakawa, a patriarch in the Yakuza's Tojo clan. Then we learn about our guy, Ichiban Kasuga, more affectionately known as Ichi. Again, this is our guy, man with a heart of gold, but attempts to save the world by punching everything. Don't think too hard about the irony, it's a video game. One of his primary tasks while he's part of the Arakawa family is to look out for Arakawa's son, Masato, aka Young Master, because he's wheelchair bound, has some serious health issues. So Ichi picks up Masato, they're going out for New Year's Eve because there's this girl that the Young Master really likes. There's this whole thing about how they find out how she's playing him, but I mean, let's be real, guy, she works at a cabaret club, she's paid to flirt, I'm sorry if you fell for the trap. So the next day, Ichi gets his ass whooped by Captain Sawashiro because he fucked up on his collections. Arakawa is all like, Ichi, stop getting your ass kicked, come walk with me. While they walk, Arakawa tells a very compelling story that I urge you to try to remember. So back in the day, Arakawa was sneaking around with this little sweet thing. While he was part of a Yakuza family and he was supposed to be dating this Yakuza boss's daughter. Him and the little sweet thing have a kid. Yakuza finds out, boss is pissed, and then they send a hit squad after Bay and the newborn baby. I mean, it's really fucked up, but that's just how the Yakuza roll. They come up with this novel idea for her to put the baby in a locker while she runs away and hides, and then Arakawa will come in later and attempt to get the baby out of the locker, but <gasps> he doesn't know what locker it is. All he hears is the baby crying. That man beats the shit out of the locker, just like hand and fist beats up a locker. He's like, open up, bitch! That's my baby! Hands are all bloody and shit, but then it opens. And there's a young child inside. He grabs his child. Honestly, baby looks dead as fuck. So he freaks out and he rushes to the hospital. Turns out that baby would end up being the young master. Health issues and all because he got hypothermia while he was in that locker. We also learn about Ichi's story while him and Arakawa are speaking. So Ichi, mom, worked at a soap land. Basically, soap land's a brothel. And she disappeared the day he was born. He was adopted by the soap land's owner. But once that owner died, he got into all kinds of crazy shit. So Kid Ichi ends up fucking up a Yakuza. Didn't know he was Yakuza until it was too late. His ass gets caught, and then right before they kill his ass, he spits out the name Arakawa because he just heard it once and thought that would help him get out. Basically, he's bluffing his way to not die. So the Yakuza call Arakawa. Arakawa, who has never seen this kid his entire fucking life, shows up. The man cuts his own pinky off to save this random bitch ass kid who put his name out there, but he really didn't do it for the kid, he did it for the preserver's name, but still, cuts his own pinky off, and Arakawa's all like, it's over, kid, take your bitch ass home, but Kid Ichi's like, fuck that, I ain't going nowhere, and proceeds to stand outside the Arakawa family house for over a 100 days until they invite his ass to join the family. The first job for Kid Ichi is to basically attend to the young master, and that continues on to present day. I know the beginning of this whole thing is a very slow burn. Stick with me. It's all very important. Trust me. You'll learn later on in the video that it's, it's a, it'll blow your fucking mind. Just stick with me. So anyway, Ichi gets a called into the Arakawa office and finds out that Captain Sawashiro, the guy who was beating his ass earlier, killed a Yakuza officer. His boss is basically begging him to go to jail in his place in order to save the family name. Well, me personally, I'd be like, fuck you. Fuck him. Because that guy's a bitch. But I am also not Yakuza. I did not swear an oath to them, so I'm not sure how the loyalty is. But Ichi, being the lovable, loyal guy that he is, is all like, Fuck yeah, I'll do it, boss. You saved my life. I've been waiting for a chance like this my whole life. It's the least I could do for you. I got you. I got you. I mean, if you think about it that way, it, he does have a point. So Ichi sends his own ass to jail. Doesn't pass go. No $200. None of that shit. Spends 18 whole years in prison. You know how long 18 years is? Do a quick Google search about technology from 2000 to 2019. If you're at least 20, think about the entire life and everything that has changed over it. 18 years is a long fucking time. Ichi went to jail before the Xbox came out, 
And now he's coming out of jail when the Xbox Series X is coming out. So he's never seen the Xbox, the Xbox 360, or the Xbox One. That's a long fucking time. Anyway, so my man finally gets out. Our guy Ichi is now free as a bird. Fuck yeah, let's go Ichi. But what the fuck? There's no one there to pick him up. Where's the boss? And all the people who are supposed to be saying thank you, Ichi, for sending your ass in jail for 18 years and taking the fall for us. But there's no one there. There's no one there. Then we go to a cutscene that isn't that important to the story, but I'm sure a lot of you are asking, why the hell does this guy look like he just got struck by lightning? My man's wanting to get a haircut after leaving jail. I mean, come on, you can't blame him. Let's be real. But the lady fucks it up, because he wanted a haircut from 2000. It is now 2019. She has no idea what a punch perm is. Why he doesn't go to Barber during any point in this entire game is beyond me, but here we are, and I thought I would explain that, because I'm sure some of you are probably asking. Then my man learns all about the shit that went down while he was in jail, and it was some shit. Basically, the new governor releases a plan to rid the city of organized crime. Tojo clan get run out, which opens up room for the Omi Alliance to step in. Arakawa is now the head of the Omi Alliance instead of one of the Arakawa families because he's a fucking snitch and ratted out the Tojo clan in order to get them pushed out. Now the Omi and the police are all in cahoots together. My guy Ichi's all in denial, like the boss wouldn't do that shit. That's not honorable. What the fuck is going on? So he decides to go back and find the boss to figure out what the hell is happening. Ichi finds his way to this meeting to confront boss man. And as a welcome home gift, Arakawa pulls out a fucking gun. A gun. And is all like, I'm sorry, Ichi. Gun goes bop! And me and the rest of the player base is like, oh shoot! And see. Like, how you gonna pull a gun on your mans like that after he just spent 18 years in prison for the family? It's fucked up, Arakawa. It's fucked up. Anyway, screen goes black. Ichi's unconscious. Obviously, he got shot. When he comes to, he's in a trash can. I mean, the guy's doing his best Oscar the Grouch impression. And he has no clue why the hell he is where he is or what the hell is going on. He's stitched up for some reason, but he's in a homeless camp. And he meets our guy Namba, who basically saved his life. After whooping some Chinese gang member ass, Ichi finds out that he is in another city called Ijinsho that is essentially held up by three opposing factions called the Ijin Three. The Chinese Yokohama Liomang, the Korean Gomi Jewel, and the Japanese Yakuza Seryu clan. These factions are at a stalemate and in turn form what is known as the Great Wall of Muscle, which is somehow keeps outside influences away. Like maybe a little group called the Omi Alliance. He also finds a mysterious fake bill in his pocket. The same pocket that has a bullet hole in it, but the bill doesn't have a hole in it. What? Who put the bill in his pocket? What does it mean? Why is it fake? I don't know. Let's find out. So now you're homeless. Really though, my mans cannot catch a break. First, he is low level Yakuza. Then he goes to jail for 18 years. Then he gets shot. Now he's homeless. So you start picking up odd jobs for a local recruiter. During one of those jobs, you run into a group called Bleach Japan, basically an organization hell bent on bleaching, and I put that in air quotes, bleaching the gray zones or areas that use loopholes in the law to get by. Brothels, illegal immigrants, that sort of thing. The Jinsho branch is led by this little fuck named Kume. Don't worry, if you play the game, you'll learn to hate him just as much as I do. So you get another job at a soap land. The boss is a total dick, but after scaring the shit out of him, you accept his request to investigate why one of his girls keeps skipping work. One thing leads to another, you beat the shit out of a bunch of nursing home security, and the Yakuza boss that's killing old people and collecting social security checks. Then, like a mature adult that you are, you decide to say, fuck you, You're, I'm gonna go snitch on this motherfucker, and you run to the place where the Serayu clan's chairman is. Basically, Ichi believes the whole thing is against the Yakuza code, and is beyond immoral, I mean, he isn't wrong. This is all very important because this series of events leads you to meeting the chairman of the Serayu clan, Old Man Hoshino. Anyway, you did the thing, congrats. High fives all around. You go back to report your findings to the Soapland owner. You walk in and you're like, oh shit. He's dead. At a funeral, you meet Saiko. She informs you that she was on the phone with the deceased when he died and she thinks it was a hit and not a suicide. And looks like a suicide. Cops think it's a suicide, but she thinks that it was Yokohama Liomang because in the background when she was on that phone call, there was a lot of Chinese dialect being yelled back and forth. Ichi decides to investigate. You and your crew get jobs at one of the Yokohama Liomang's warehouses. You find out they're doing some shady shit. One thing leads to another. You punch a few more people, and then you end up blowing up the whole fucking warehouse. Honestly, this might as well be a Michael Bay movie at this point. Your sleepy ass wakes up in a basement, chained up by none other than Mabuchi himself. Mabuchi being the second in command at the Yokohama Liomang's game. He essentially uses your ass to incite a war between them and the Serayu because he's using you as a quote-unquote Serayu member because you're Japanese. And like any good villain, he leaves so his peasants can try to deal with you and finish you off. Guess what? You escape. Mabushi completely fucking strike team annihilates, I mean, Swiss cheeses these two low-level 
Yakuza's who send the entire Serayu group and the captain into a whole fucking rage revenge mode. I'm going to get strapped and cap some motherfuckers and get the homies ready to go to raid the Chinese HQ. Shit's really, really going down to this point. You rush into Chinese territory to try to stop a war. Run into Zhao, the head of the Lokohama Leo Mang. Tell his boy, Mabuchi is fucking up, but Zhao wants evidence because that's his boy. Of course, he's not going to take the word of just some random punk guy who came in and started beating up all his homies. And you get a tip that the Gomi Jewel has evidence to help you incriminate Mabuchi further. So you fight your way through the Gomi Jewel bunker, which is riddled with surveillance, riddled with all this high-tech shit because that's how the Gomi Jewel get all the information. And I mean the Gomi Jewel see everything. By the way, their setup is really fucking nice, but the wire management needs some work. But I digress. You get brought into their counterfeiting operation and learn all kinds of oh shit level information. That bill in Ichi's pocket was counterfeit made by the Gomi Jewel. Oh shit. Namba's a bitch ass two timer who used you to get close to the Gomi Jewel. Oh shit. He was looking for his brother who disappeared while investigating the counterfeit operation. Oh shit. And the bill in our pocket gave him a clue to follow but he still doesn't know how Ichi got the bill. Ah, shit. Because Ichi's that dude, even after learning all of this and Namba's two time and ass, because Namba saved Ichi's life, and because Namba's motivation was legit in Ichi's eyes trying to save his brother, he fights off the Gomi Jewel and helps Namba escape. Then you get invited to a meeting by the head of the Gomi Jewel, and when you arrive, oh, shit, you see her? Zhao, the head of the Yokohama Liomong, and old man Hoshino, the head of the Sarayu clan, all sitting there. The three heads of the warring Ijinsho factions are just chilling in a room, waiting to speak with Ichi to tell my guy what's up. Then bombs just start dropping left and right. We learn about the history of Ijinsho, how the counterfeiting operation is a joint effort by all three groups, how this helps feed money into a certain politician who's protecting the entire city in the gray zones, how only the three heads know about this, and how the gray zones this creates actually harbors and helps those countless people who have nowhere else to go. And if Namba's bitch ass snitches, the whole operation screeches to a crumbling halt. And how Ijinsho and its people are fucked! If that happens, now we gotta stop Namba. Well, lo and behold, that is exactly what Namba does. He snitches this shit to the Bleach Japan's head office. You learn the Omi are involved with this whole fucking plan because if the E Gene 3 and the Great Wall crumble, they can invade and take over, which is what they wanna do. Mabuchi's there all in cahoots with the Bleach Japan and the Omi because he's trying to take over, fuck over Zhao, and be that guy. And after you beat Mabuchi's ass, you learn something very interesting. Now, this is one of the biggest oh shits of the entire fucking game. So again, if you were tired of spoilers, turn it off now. Oh my god! You learn that the young master is actually the governor. The governor who did the 3K plan, the one who helped Agasawara found Bleach Japan. He is the young master. And he can walk. He can walk. He's not in a wheelchair anymore. Like, the dude, it's, it's, it's hidden, dude. And only Ichi was the one that recognized him. So after you fight Mabuchi and Ogasawara and learn this information about the young master being the governor, you interrogate Ogasawara and you learn a lot of shit. A lot of stuff. So you learn that Ogasawara and uh, Ryo Aoki, which is now the name of the young master because he changed his name because you're not going to get into politics if you have the name of a Yakuza. They found a Bleach Japan together. You learn that Aoki went to the U.S., got an operation to fix his condition, learned law, came back to Japan, started Bleach Japan, and climbed up the political ladder. You also learn that he uses Yakuza connections with his father to eradicate the Tojo clan because basically Arakawa stitched on the whole motherfucker and essentially control his father and the Omi alliance. So everyone is underneath the power-hungry thumb of... Aoki. So he's in control of the Omi, he's in control of Bleach Japan. His goal is essentially to get rid of the last political leader that outwardly opposes him. This man's just trying to gain as much power and influence as he possibly can. There's one person standing in his way. That person is the political leader that is overseeing the EG3 counterfeiting operation that I mentioned earlier. So going back to Nanba, because he snitched and partnered with Bleach Japan to find his brother, the counting for operation is now out in the open. Bleach Japan is ready to raid the Gomi Jewel hideout, and the Omi are on the verge of invading Ijinsho. The political figure supporting the whole thing is about to be overrun by Aoki because everything is going to shit. So what does Ichi do? He tries 
to help the Gomi Joel because he's just a good fucking dude like that. He fights a bunch of Omi, including Ishioda and Omi Lieutenant, fights a fucking wrecking ball, and then helps hold off the Omi assault while the Gomi Joel would just burn everything to the fucking ground. No evidence, no problem, right? Wrong. Because then you find out that Zhao got his ass captured by Mabuchi and some of the Omi lieutenants. So then you go to save his ass. You climb up this tower. Of course, it's at the top floor of a tower because why wouldn't it be? You meet Tendo, another Omi lieutenant, but he's like, fuck you. You're not cool enough to fight me, so I'm out. But everyone else tries to fuck you up, including Ishioda. But look who comes to save the day. Fucking Nanba. Nanba is back. Nanba is out here trying to repent and help out the crew because he feels bad for leaving. He feels bad for snitching. Too little, too late, motherfucker, but we appreciate your help. After you whip on everyone, you all have this really, really touching, heartfelt moment. Kumbaya, that shit. Everyone's friends. Let's fucking go. And he's with you till the bitter end. You also learn his brother is alive, which is all cool and well, but still, fuck his brother because he took Namba out of your party for the last two chapters or so, and Namba was basically pretty crucial if you needed any type of magic or spell or fire. Anyway. Nama then gives you a tip about the homeless camp chief and how he might know something about what is going on, about how he may have ended up in Ijinsho. Why you didn't tell us this shit earlier, I don't know, but here we are. Chief tells you about how y Yakuza, back in the day, would actually bring bodies to this homeless camp and then they would pay the homeless people to dispose of them. Nice little scheme they had going on. However, if a body was brought alive, they had to do everything in their power to save that person. Basically, you're faking a death. Did Arakawa know this? Did he send Ichi to this homeless camp hoping he would be saved? Was it even Arakawa that did it? Did someone else send him to this homeless camp? We don't know. But then Hoshi knows all like, Ichi, have lunch with me, fool, because I got information about that bill in your pocket. Again, why you didn't tell us this earlier? I don't know. Fuck you, Hoshino. But again, here we are. You learn more about the counterfeiting scheme and how they would use traveling actors to transport the money. Remember, Arakawa's acting troupe in the very beginning of the game was one of those groups. And his pops got killed because he lost a bunch of that money. So remember that first cutscene that I showed and talked about when he got a bullet in his head? He caught a bullet in his head because he lost that money. Turns out his bitch-ass mother, who was cuckolding uh, the father, stole the counterfeits to go gamble with her shitty little boyfriend. Like, fuck that hoe. She's causing all these problems. She's the reason why everyone's so fucked. Anyway, the assassin that killed Arakawa's father was Hoshino. It's fucking Hoshino, dude. Arakawa worked his way up the Yakuza chain and found out that it was Hoshino and then invited his ass to dinner, but he didn't kill him. He didn't seek his revenge. He probably should have, but he didn't. When Arakawa then starts his own family, Hoshino sends him a briefcase full of these fake bills that basically says, yo, I owe you, dude. You saved my life. I owe you something. These bills are representation of me owing you. And Hoshino immediately recognized the bill when he saw it in Ichi's pocket when they first met. Now, this is fucking huge. This is huge because that means Arakawa didn't really want Ichi dead. Now, Arakawa knew that at some point he would meet Hoshino and put the bill in Ichi's pocket as a message because Arakawa's the only one that received any of those bills. I know, right? Fucking crazy. What's also crazy. Again, why did Hoshino wait so long to tell us this? Like, come on, dude. Really? Really? So you probably don't remember, but that co-founder guy from Bleach Japan that I said you interrogated, yeah, he's dead. The order came straight from Aoki, but Aoki's conniving ass uses his ex-partner's death to push his agenda forward, including appointing Kume's punk ass and a bunch of other Bleach Japan people to run for different political districts around Tokyo and Japan. Basically, by controlling the people in charge of the different districts, Aoki's exerting his power, showing the other political leaders in the party that I'm the guy, don't fuck with me. The funeral service was in Ijinsho, and Ichi uses this opportunity to confront Aoki, where they set up a meeting. At this point, Ichi learns that the young master has become a total fucking dick, and more information about what really happened before his ass went to jail. Sawashiro, the old Akara family captain, and the current third Omi lieutenant, wasn't the one who killed the Yakuza member 18 years ago. It was the Young Master. The Young Master killed that guy. The Young Master is the reason why Ichi went to jail. Don't know why Arakawa covered that shit up, but Ichi got sent to jail in Young Master's place, not Sawashiro's. Aoki then makes you an ultimatum. Ichi's like, fuck you, guy. I'm stopping your plan. Don't give me this ultimatum bullshit. And then here we are. Ichi has to fight his way out of that trap, and then he gets out, because why wouldn't he? The next day, you get a call from your homie, 
from back when you were in the Tojo, and he tells your ass to come to Sotenbori to meet with Arakara. You're desperate for answers, so instead of following the plan, you go a day early and naturally fight all the Omi to get to Arakara instead of just walking in when you're supposed to and be like, yo, guy, what's up? But when you're fighting all the Omi, you also fight, and this is a big deal for anyone who's known anything about the Yakuza series, Goro Majima, the mad dog of Shimano and Taiga Saijiman. These motherfuckers are Yakuza legends in their boss fight. Crazy. If you know anything about the Yakuza universe, you should know this is a big fucking deal. Anyway, after you whoop on each other for a bit, Arakawa himself stops the fight and is joined by Daigo Dojima, the sixth chairman of the Tojo clan. This is the top head guy that runs the whole show. He's a big deal. You're all meeting and Ichi learns that everything that has happened since he went to prison was orchestrated and planned ahead of time. What? What? This is all planned? What? Arakawa snitching, the Tojo going into hiding, the Omi takeover, everything was meticulously planned out for the next day. For when the real Omi captain gets out of jail and together with Daigo officially decide to dissolve the Tojo and the Omi alliance. But why the fuck would you do that? Basically the heads are sick of where the Yakuza were headed and they did not like being under Aoki's thumb and the 3k plan and everything else that has been instituted. So they figured, hey, if we dissolve the clans, then fuck you Aoki, you can't tell anyone to do your dirty work because there's no such thing as Yakuza anymore. So they make this announcement and the entire Omi, Tojo, Yakuza fam, everyone is fucking pissed. They're all like, fuck you, you can't do this. Why the fuck would you do this? Daigo, you being a bitch, let's go. And this huge brawl happens because again, why the fuck would anything happen peacefully in the Yakuza video game series? I mean, let's be real. But in order to protect the captains, everyone's fighting and shit's getting crazy. And in the scuffle, one guy picks up a knife and just rushes the shit out of the Omi captain. And he's like, Watase, you're gonna die. And we're all like, oh, fuck, that dude's getting stabbed. This shit's gonna get fucked up. But then, bam, this fucking guy catches the meanest right hook I've seen in a long fucking time. You know why? Because he caught this right hook by the dragon of Dojima. I will bet my whole fucking paycheck and everything that exists that every Yakuza fan in this point is like, holy fucking shit, Kiru Kazuma is back, let's go, blew everyone's fucking mind, dude, for those of you that don't know, this is your guide through Yakuza 1 through 6, all great games, great stories, play them all, you won't be disappointed, seriously, do it, like, do it now, okay, you played all the games, great, now we can continue. So both organizations are officially dissolved and Yakuza are officially over. Back in Ijin Show, you meet up with the, our guy Arakawa. You had this night heart to heart about the future and stuff, but then Arakawa brings up Ichi's birth story and how it never really sat well with him. He talks about a dream when his girl from back in the day has a baby at a soap land that Ichi was born at. But instead of Ichi, that baby was Masato that gets born at the soap land. Interesting. You wake up the next morning and Hoshino has left a message on your phone. Arakawa's dead. Your boss, your mentor, your father figure, the guy that you just had this very interesting conversation with, dead. Very sad moment. Now you're trying to get close to Aoki through his candidate pick Kume, but you get a call from the Serai UHQ is being attacked by the Omi Alliance. You rush there to see Hoshino with a bullet hole in his chest. Sawashiro is also there waiting for you. Sawashiro, did you kill this motherfucker? Why, why are we out here doing Aoki's dirty work when the Omi has been dissolved? Spoiler alert, there's a handful of Omi who are like, fuck you, we're gonna make our own Yakuza clan. We don't care that you dissolve shit. After punching Sawashiro a bunch, because how else would you solve this problem? You learn something that Sawashiro has never told anyone. Ever. Like, ever. And this is a bomb, so get ready for this shit. Sawashiro was a piece of shit human being when he was young. He still kind of is, but especially when he was young. He gets this girl pregnant, but can't support the family. Didn't want to have this child. They can't abort. There was no miscarriage, so the kid is born. He convinces his girl to leave the kid in a locker. A fucking locker. Homegirls are like, why did I agree to this? I'm going to go back and get my baby. So she runs back to get the kid with him chasing her, only to find Arakawa, young Arakawa back in the day, beating the shit out of that very same locker. He gets the baby out, runs to the hospital. Several years later, Sawashiro saw the child in a wheelchair, joined the Arakawa family to help look after the young master, Arakawa's quote-unquote son, aka Sawashiro's real son. But soon after, 
the Shangri-La soap plant owner comes by, opens the locker next to the locker Arakawa beat the shit out of, pulls out another baby, all the while talking about how the plan must not have gone how she wanted it. Now, if your jaw isn't on the floor right now, let me help you. Let me help you. Arakawa's child and Sawashira's child were both in those lockers because Arakawa, his girl dropped the child off in the locker. Sawashiro put his kid in the locker. Different motivations here, but both kids were in those lockers. Sawashiro claims that Arakawa took his son because the exact same locker that Arakawa was beating the shit out of was the one Sawashiro put his kid in, which means the other kid was taken by the Shangri-La owner. Ichi was born and raised at the Shangri-La Soapland by the same exact guy. This all implies, and again, I'm connecting the dots for you, some, some of you that aren't like in complete fucking shock and awe right now. That implies that Ichi is Arakawa's real son. Masato, the young master, is actually Sawashiro's son, and Ichi is Arakawa's son. Now think about that. Back to the last conversation that Arakawa and Ichi had about that dream, where he wanted Masato to be born at the Soapland, so then Arakawa maybe would have gone into the locker to get Ichi. Did Arakawa really know that Ichi was his real son? This whole thing is just straight blowing minds all over the place. Ichi always saw Arakawa as a father figure, but for him to really be his father, that is so crazy, dude. Anyway, at this point, Ichi's just fucking pissed, dude. Aoki's out here putting hits on all the family, betraying Sawashiro, getting his own quote-unquote father killed, doing whatever he wants with his power. In a fit of rage, Ichi just starts beating the shit out of everyone trying to find answers about where Aoki is, how he can get some kind of justice. But he randomly gets stopped by someone very interesting. The dragon's back, y'all. Kiru Kazuma stops Ichi from basically finishing off this Yakuza dude, and Kiru says he knows Aoki's next move. But they have to talk at the Gomi Jewel HQ. Ichi shows up, and Kiru says, you gotta earn this shit, guy. Like, I did not like how you're beating the shit out of this dude for no reason. You're blinded by rage. Show me that you're worth this information. And then they do the whole, like, fancy fucking rip off the thing. I don't know how you can grab the shoulder of your shirt and your coat and just rip that shit off, and immediately you're just, like, taking everything off in one fell swoop. That's the most gangstest Yakuza shit ever. If I ever join the Yakuza, that's the first thing I'm learning. They decide to beat the shit out of each other. Probably one of the harder boss fights in the entire game. I mean, he is the dragon of Dojima. The fight was a total bitch. But then you find out that Aoki sent Ishioda and an assassin known as Miraface to go kill Sawashiro. So after you beat Sawashiro, he gets put in jail. So now they're trying to make sure he doesn't snitch to the cops. You stop the plot by beating him up. But before finishing off Ishioda, you learn that Ishioda and Sawashiro didn't actually kill Arakawa. It was Tendo. You then go to a scene where Tendo's on the phone with one of the Yakuza while you're over here interrogating Ishioda. And there's C4 planted on that floor. Boom! This shit goes sky fucking high. And that's all you see. That's all you know. But in the next chapter, magically somehow, Ichi appears at one of Aoki's rallies in Kamurocho. You shake hands with him and you tell him there's evidence of all the bullshit that Aoki's been under. And it's in some tower knowing full well that he's going to send Tendo to go find it. So you fight your way at this tower, you find Tendo, you fuck up Tendo for killing Arakawa, then Aoki shows up because he doesn't hear from Tendo and wants to make sure everything's taken care of, and then he goes up to the floor where you all are, and then he sees Tendo sitting on a desk and all of you are knocked out on the floor. Aoki talks to Tendo about disposing of the bodies and all the other incriminating shit that got him to where he was, but he gets got because you were faking it, and the Tendo that was talking to Aoki is a pissed off mirror face. Don't fuck with an assassin and use him as disposable currency. He'll get you back. The crew records the entire thing on video and now Aoki is pissed because he just got got. He tries to fight you, but let's be honest, he a little bitch. The boss fight is actually pretty easy. Even after all the shit Aoki did and put Ichi through through the entire game, Ichi is still loyal to the end and tries to help the young master redeem himself. Cops show up, Aoki takes a hostage and dips. He like, he's out. Ichi meets him at the lockers where they are both stashed. They have another heart to heart. Ichi wins him over with the power of love. And right before it's all good, and right before Aoki is gonna turn himself in, and right before Aoki is gonna make amends and become a new man, Kume's bitch ass stabs him. 
because Kume found out about all the shit that was going down, and Kume, who's like a loyalist to the Bleach Japan movement, learns that Aoki's a phony, and stabs the motherfucker in a fit of rage. I told you I hated that little fuck, and I hope you do too. I really wish there's some DLC that comes out where you just beat the shit out of Kume. Anyway, Kume stabs him. Ichi picks up Aoki and sprints off the exact same way Arakawa did with Masato when he was a baby. So the whole thing comes full circle. It's so insane. The story is, oh my god, blow your mind. Spoiler alert, because there haven't been enough already, Aoki dies. Three years after the events of Yakuza 6, Kiryu is working for the Daidoji, a corrupt political organization that's been controlling Japan's politics and economy. If you don't remember, the head of Daidoji wanted Kiryu killed after he found out about that big ass battleship in Yakuza 6. His old ass died instead, and new Daidoji leadership made a deal with Kiryu. Instead of killing him, the Daidoji would fake kill him. Kiryu's willing to fake his death and erase his name, see what I did there, in order to protect his family. He promised to keep the corruption secret and become a Daidoji agent, and they would fund the orphanage and keep Kiryu fed, sheltered, and hidden. And by hidden, I mean they give him a pair of sunglasses that aren't even fully tinted. We really couldn't come up with a better disguise, huh, RGG? While chilling at the Daidoji temple hideout, Kiryu, whose name is now Joru, again, great cover, gets approached by his handler, Hanawa. Kiryu has to help oversee his smuggling operation and get some background on the events of the last couple of years while he's been in hiding. Some of this will sound familiar if you've seen my Like a Dragon video. The government is going balls deep on organized crime and has virtually wiped the Tojo out while also working with the Omi. They had help when this guy Arakara sold the Tojo out and is now acting captain of the Omi until Watase, this guy from Yakuza 5, gets out of jail. As all things do in these games, what is supposed to be a simple job goes to complete shit when it turns into a full-on raid. Dudes bust out this truck like Surprise, motherfucker! Taking Daidoji heads off like they're pinatas, setting guys on fire, and there's this creepy Hanya mask guy. It's fucking chaos. Kiryu figures out they're trying to take Hanawa, catches guys punched like, bitch, please. Can't believe it when Goon sees through that masterful disguise and beats them all up because that's what our guy does best. The next day, Hanawa sends Kiryu out to investigate a lead, and of course he runs into the gang from the night before. Their leader calls him Mai's real name, but Joru's all like, who, me? Yes, he annoyingly plays dumb the entire game. They just wanted to talk, but didn't ask nicely, so Kiryu puts them all down. Then their leader, man with a suit, pulls up like Kiryu didn't annihilate the whole squad and catches hands too. Kiryu learns that they are Omi Alliance and set up the raid to kidnap Hanawa, hoping to find Kiryu. Kiryu grabs the guy, Hanawa pulls up, and they head for a safe house. On the way, BOOM! Van T-bones the shit out of Hanawa's car. Hanya guy steps out looking like a fake ass Majima wannabe, and after Kiryu breaks the mask we learn why Scarface had it on in the first place. Hanawa manages to get himself captured and the Omi get away, but not before Kiryu is given a phone and some information. Man in the suit is Suruno, captain of the Watase family, and he's trying to recruit Kiryu because Watase needs him for something. Hmm. Kiryu's back at the temple getting debriefed by this asshole who wears leather jackets because he's clearly overcompensating for something. Kiryu says, we gotta save Hanawa, give me the phone. Leather jacket guy's like, nah fam, he's a liability, which means I get to act cool and point guns in my leather jacket, you know, Terminator shit. Kiryu bounces back like, fuck your leather jacket, you look like a Japanese Phil Spencer. Leather jacket guy dips while his boys handle Kiryu, but y'all acting like four dudes can stop the dragon of Dojima. Bitch, get off me! Peasants get put down and Master Roshi gives the phone back to Kiryu. He's the agent who trained Hanawa and pickpocketed leather jacket guy so he could help Kiryu save him. Kiryu fights his way through the entire Daidoji complex and gets a call from Suruno. Because some things never change, they meet at a bar. This conversation goes absolutely nowhere as Suruno's making this revelating speech and offers to give Kiryu his life back. But Kiryu's all like, I don't know who this Kiryu person is. I'm here for Hanawa. Eventually, Suruno's like, fuck it, and just gives Kiryu a red tiger and tells him to find Akame and Sultan Bori so he can prove himself. Akame is basically the female florist, info broker, friend to the homeless, no cool robe, but she's cuter than the floor, so I guess it's a fair trade. The red tiger means she's supposed to bring him somewhere, but we can't do that right now because instead she's making Kiryu run errands like saving homeless people and researching the new quote unquote immersive cabaret club. Are you winning, son? RGG really made this a required mission because simps stay simping. Once you're done staring at Ayu's giant tits, Akame brings more debauchery to Kiryu's life as she finally flies him to the castle, an adult wonderland that makes Vegas look like Mormon Bible study. Why would the Omi want Kiryu here? Remember, he has to prove himself. And what better way to do that than another fight club? The Red Tiger is his entry ticket. There, Kiryu runs into Shishido, the fake Majima that kidnapped Hanawa. 
He says if Kiryu survives his fights, he'll tell him where they took Hanawa. Kiryu also sees Nishitani, patriarch of the Omi's Kijin clan, and the guy who runs the castle. After getting registered, Kiryu says he needs a disguise. Apparently the glasses don't work anymore even though he's still calling himself Joru. Shishido was kind enough to leave Kiryu a mask, but I didn't want to fight his gay Mysterio, so we cosplayed Persona 5's Fox instead. Each fight is based on a major event in Yakuza history, so Kiryu starts rewriting history like the gladiator when he kicks fake Watase's ass. Then he relives Yakuza's one's finale, but this time he's Nishiki kicking fake Kiryu's ass. And during the final Colosseum fight, Kiryu is ironically playing himself against no fucking way. Is that really Ryuji? During the fight, Ryuji question mark is tight, he's catching a hand, so drops Kido into a ring with two fucking tigers. Legit 600 pound, rip your face off, tigers. Make no mistake, this isn't the first tiger Kido's had to fight, and I mean that literally. So he drops them both with his bare hands. Then he finishes Ryuji question mark by grabbing this full grown mountain of a man and straight up BOOM! Bats the fucking tiger across the arena. This game is wild. Let's go, Kiryu, Joru, whatever your name is. Are you not entertained? By the way, S in chat for cream and sugar. Not sure who names tigers after coffee condiments, but here we are. Also, for the record, that's not really Ryuji. Kiryu calls him out because only bitches fight with tigers. Real Ryuji throws hands. Shishido's impressed but has to monologue before telling us what we all want to know. Where is Hanawa? Hanawa is in Sotsumbori, so Kiryu has to head all the way back to where he started finds the building, and proceeds to beat the shit out of everyone there as he heads to the top floor. Eventually, he finds Hanawa, who's all messed up. Suruno sends his boy who has a saw, but Kiryu drops him like, sit the fuck down. Suruno takes the saw, grabs a branding iron because people have those on roofs for some reason, but Suruno forgot. Fire doesn't work on dragons. Sit your bitch ass down too. Hanawa is freed and a beat up Suruno tells Kiryu that Watase needs him as he and Daigo are planning a dissolution of the Omi and Tojo. Wait, what? No more Yakuza? But this really shouldn't be a surprise if you know anything about the first Like a Dragon game. As I mentioned before, the law is actively targeting organized crime, and Yakuza are becoming slaves to corrupt government officials. The plan is to dissolve before this fate becomes a reality. Of course, dissolution will piss off a ton of Yakuza, and all hell is sure to break loose. Watase thinks having a Yakuza legend on his side might make the situation a little less chaotic. Suruto then pleads with Kiryu, kill Hanawa and the Omi will give you your life back. Shut up, I don't kill. Also, who's Kiryu? Suruno is taken captive and now Hanawa's boss, Headless Professor X guy, wants to talk to Kiryu. They're not happy Kiryu's identity got leaked and want him to prove that he's still loyal to their original agreement. In order to do that, he has to kill Suruno. <gasps> Kiryu takes the gun, points it at Suruno, and then takes Hanawa hostage. He tells Suruno to escape, and his ass takes off like, Had us the first half, I'm not gonna lie. Kiryu then proceeds to beat the hell out of everyone, including the dude he just saved, but gets stopped cold when he sees the Daidoji have morning glory surrounded. Kiryu gets locked up until Daidoji decide to execute him. Nah, are they really gonna kill our guy? Hanawa's hesitating. I mean, Kiryu did save his life, but everyone around him then points a gun at him, so now it's kill or be killed. Kiryu's like, dude, just fucking do it. I've been dead for three years and miserable for seven games. Put me out of my misery. But Hanawa can't pull the trigger. They're really going to kill Hanawa? Psych! Hanawa's boss literally rolls in, and he's the one that put this entire sick situation together in order to test the bond between Hanawa and Kiryu. And it's a good thing it worked out too, because that gun was loaded, and if Hanawa pulled the trigger, Kiryu's brain would have been splattered all over that fucking floor. So why did they spare Kiryu after that betrayal? Because Saruno turned around and paid Daidoji 50 billion yen for Kiryu's life. What the fuck? Based on current exchange rates, that's almost 340 million USD. You know what the fuck you can buy with 340 million dollars? I'll tell you, Katy Perry. Now Kiryu's working with the Omi and after updating his look with that clean ass fit, well, at least it's better than whatever the fuck this is, Suruno explains that Watase and Daigo have been planning the Yakuza dissolution for the last two years. Tojo trader slash acting captain of the Omi, Arakawa, is in on it as well, and once Watase gets out of jail, they're making the announcement. The last thing they need to do is get rid of Nishitani. He would oppose the plan and rally a large enough force to simply reform the Omi. Kiryu's all like, I'm not a killer. 
really kiddo really still going with this whole i don't kill thing okay let's just assume that every single person we caught with this heat action is wearing a vest and he survived that obvious headshot and this dude is not going to bleed to death after getting viciously shanked not once but twice before help arrives but we all know that help's not coming because you beat the shit out of them too next you tell me jodo can kill but kiddo doesn't i'm fucking done with this anyway mid explanation nishitani calls like Gotcha, bitch. and sends the whole crew after Kidu because he knows Joru isn't really who he says he is. Kidu go go gadget Spidey swings through the ship trying to escape while fighting off Payday NPCs and Speedos. But just as Kidu's nearing the helicopter, Nishitani rolls up like he's Kuze from Yakuza 0. Who has a motorcycle on a boat? Then Nishitani starts getting a hard on about fighting Kidu like he's Majima. But this isn't a ha ha silly Majima hard on. This dude needs help. You gay. Kidu needs to make sure he's still talking about a fight because. That's gay. And Nishitani says he is, but then proceeds to say, and I quote, this won't end till I pound your ass to death. Hey yo, what the fuck? Kidu beats down Nishitani for crimes against sanity, but that ass whooping confirms Nishitani's suspicion when he figures out Jordu is really the dragon of Boom! You got knocked the fuck out, man! Nishitani gets straight bodied, but is left there because his whole crew is watching and Saruno has to protect his cover. If they really want to get at Nishitani, they need to lure him off the boat. Luckily, Kidu has a plan. He gets 30 million from Saruno and straight up blows it all in one night. He's going hard. He got the homies. He got the best cabaret girls. It is literally raining money. Living up like he's been dead for three years. Wait. The idea is that Nishitani will get so upset that Kiryu's not scared of him. He'll leave the boat and take Kiryu out himself. Especially if Kiryu beats up Nishitani's whole crew that very same night. The next morning, Kiryu finds out they got Nishitani off the boat. But Hanawa brings up a good point. Nishitani is fucking crazy. An assassin, and you don't know when he'll pop up. Kiryu really needs to draw him out of hiding if he wants a chance at him. So to do this, Kiryu and the homies steal his boat while he's not there, show it off to the public, and do their best Lonely Island impression until Nishitani calls Saruno mad as hell. I'm on a boat, motherfucker, don't you ever forget? Saruno's trying to keep his cover, so he's all like, What? But says he'll give Kiryu his number. First thing Kiryu does is send a picture of himself with Nishitani's girls on his boat. <laughs> Sensational. Naturally, this sends Nishitani into a frenzy until he finally tells Kiryu where to meet. Spoiler, it's a trap. But after beating the hell out of the crew, Shishido gives Kiryu a ride to where Nishitani is really hiding. Again, Kiryu fights his way through the building, making sure not to kill anyone, of course. And then they get to Nishitani. He calls Kiryu out again because he's sure he's not really Joru. Kiryu takes off his glasses and Nishitani freaks out because he can finally confirm his theory. This game is giving way too much credit to that shitty disguise. Nishitani talks more shit, Kiryu makes him eat his own words, and as he's trying to escape, no way. Shishido kills Nishitani? On Saruno's order? They can't take any chances when it comes to dissolution, so they gotta get rid of him. Kiryu's tight because he's an accomplice to murder, while both only try to justify their action. The building goes up in flames, but hold up. What happened to the body? While Nishitani's out of the picture, Kiryu's chilling until Watase gets out of prison. Meanwhile, the events that happen during Yakuza Like a Dragon unfold as the two timelines begin to merge. The Citizens Liberal Party, run by the corrupt Daidoji officer, is taken over by Aoki, who also controls the Omi. Ichi's chasing Arakawa for answers, and all the Yakuza legends are starting to gather Omi HQ. The night before Watase's release, Kidu's catching up with Hanawa. Both Hanawa and the Daidoji want to show their appreciation for everything Kidu's doing and offer him a vacation when this is all over. He did make them 50 billion yen. Kidu says he'd like to visit Hawaii as his true love and Haruka's mother, Yumi, said it'd be the perfect place to get married. He mentions wanting to go to the chapel Yumi talked about and leave the ring he gave her during Yakuza 1. The next day, Watase is finally out of jail and meets up with his people to get ready for the announcement. But just as all things in this franchise, it never goes according to plan. Shishido, you two-timing fake-ass Majima Flaw and Scarface-ass bitch! He and all the Omi there turn on Watase, Kiryu, and Saruno. And to make things worse, Nishitani's alive? Shishido never actually killed Nishitani. He used a fake blood knife to make it look like he killed him, then made a deal on the side so the two of them could take over the Omi after they take out Watase. They do the bad guy monologue thing, but it doesn't matter because Kiryu roundhouses Nishitani off a three-story scaffold and then sends Shishido into the abyss. Right when you think it's over, Saruno's over here doing dumb shit by nudging Nishitani, who then slices dude shit. Then right when Saruno's about to catch a foot-long blade, oh shit. Watase steps in and he's the one that gets shanked? By the way, dude got kicked off a three-story building. How the hell is he up and ready to fight? Boom! 
Then Nishitani gets straight leveled by Hanawa's car. The homies get patched up and cleaned up. Don't know how the hell Nishitani is still alive after that massacre. And they head for Omi HQ to announce the dissolution. The next part will look very familiar if you know Yakuza like a dragon. They arrive at Omi HQ. Watase announces the Omi dissolution. Everyone's all like, what the fuck? Daigo announces the Tojo dissolution. Everyone's still all like, fuck you, Watase. And Saijima starts tossing dudes by their faces. Majima is saving the world from tacky neckwear. And all hell breaks loose as Ichi and crew beat the hell out of the Omi. Then one dude finds a knife, an opening, and starts screaming, Watase! Boom! Fucking body. I see it coming every time, but it never gets old. The dragon of Dojima makes his presence known as he knocks this dude all the way out. But remember, that's not Kidu. That's just some bodyguard Watase hired. I'm so done with this. They quell the uprising. Kidu quietly gives respect to his successor, Ichi, and the Yakuza legends head out to deliver the dissolution letter. But we're not done yet. Maybe Kiru should start killing because Shishido's back, again. It takes three of them to push Shishido back as he literally catches Majima's knife. Apparently, he didn't learn his lesson the first two times he got beat down, and neither did any of the Omi that just got their ass would because they're all back for more. All the shirts come off, all the female Yakuza fans out there start dropping their panties, you know who you are, and again, there's a full-on brawl. Mid-fight, Shishido takes off because bosses like to run away in these games. Kiryu goes after him, and after more unnecessary monologuing, the generational battle between Yakuza young and old has begun. Pro tip, if you upgrade your heat actions throughout the game and bring a healthy supply of items, this fight is laughably easy. Despite the fact that Shishido has a thousand fucking health bars. After cheesing the same heat action over and over and decking Shishido off the second floor awning, it's finally over. But wait, Leather Jacket guy is kidnapping Shishido? He says he has Nishitani as well and will be using them for the Daidoji. Say what? Sometime later at the dissolution and after Ichi defeats Aoki in his own game, the Daidoji decide to reward Kiryu for everything he's done. First, Hanawa gives him a recording of his Morning Glory family visiting his grave. The kids are all grown up and paying respects to Uncle Kaz. If you can get past the fact that they randomly found this hidden camera, and if you can get past the fact that they somehow deduce this camera means Kiryu's still alive, then you can enjoy what I would argue is the most heartfelt emotional scene of this entire franchise. Hits you right in the feels as Kiru sees his family for the first time in three years. Highly recommend you check out the full scene for yourself. After Kiru's done ugly crying all over Hanawa's tablet, he's ready to go on vacation. Hanawa sets Kiru up with an all new identity and if Taichi Suzuki sounds familiar, that's because that was Kiru's secret identity when he was a taxi driver in Yakuza 5. How does Hanawa know that name? Turns out he knew Kiru before joining the Daidoji. Similar to Kiru, Hanawa had to change his name and leave his old life behind. <gasps> Who is he? The game never officially confirms this, but there are a number of very compelling Reddit threats that argue that he's really Morinaga. Oh shit. Don't know who that is? Watch my Yakuza 5 video. Several years later, Kiryu has finally made it to Hawaii cosplaying Yu Narakami from Persona 4. After all this time, he's finally made it to Yumi's Chapel, leaves the ring, and heads off to get into more shenanigans with Ichi in like a dragon infinite well. The game opens up on a stormy night with an elderly couple discussing feeding the homeless. Suddenly, oh shit, there's someone on the road? The driver slams on the brakes, but wait, where did he go? BAM! LA Noir doesn't even hesitate and blasts the driver in the head. What is BAM? Now he's lighting up the old man. BAM! 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 Old lady, dead. LA Noir steals a pendant, gives it to the mystery bad guy, and BAM! He gets shot. Less than two minutes into this game and there's already four murders. RGG came out swinging with this one. Three years after the Tojo and Omi dissolution, Ichiban Kasuga is working at a job placement agency, determined to help displace Yakuza and carry on Arakawa's dream. Since the dissolution, ex-Yakuza have been struggling. The government has a five-year ex-Yakuza clause that should be renamed to the fuck ex-Yakuza clause because for the first five years after leaving, they can't fulfill any basic needs to survive in today's world. As you'd imagine, this makes it hard to get hired, so Ichi's doing his best to help them out. They're all catching up and survive because bars will never not be a thing in this franchise, and it's obvious Ichi has a thing for Saeko. The homie barely musters the courage to ask her out, and is all kinds of hype when she says yes. Your heart cannot help but go out to our man as he dances with the random homeless people to celebrate. The day goes exactly how you'd expect, but that night Ichi goes off, bearing his soul, and because this man has no chill, he fucking proposes. What? Saiko doesn't say a word. She just slowly starts walking toward the edge like she's about to jump, but Ichi doesn't let up as he continues to dig his own grave. She thanks him for the date and leaves our guy hanging while she just walks off. 
One year later, she's not returning his text, but the homie is still focused on helping ex Yakuza. Unfortunate for that, because he just got fired. And on his way home, he runs into the dregs of society. I'm talking bottom of the barrel humanity, where evolution actually took a step backwards. Clout chasing content creators. Our dude just got fired and these assholes got their phones all in his face. Asshole number one, looking like Atsuko's grandson, says Ichi's all over the internet. Huh? And if you thought internet clout chasers were bad, now we get clickbait anime VTubers. This is the Tatara channel, a 5 million sub VTuber that does call out videos, exposing corruption among celebrities, politicians, and other areas. But this time they take Ichi's situation completely out of context when they say he's using his job to make Exikuza commit crimes. Assholes try to extort our man, but end up catching these unemployed hands. Namba says the video about Ichi was dropped three days ago, and it has over 3 million views. And of course everyone believes Tatara's story not only because they're all anime simps, but because it has built up a credible reputation with past stories. One month later, Ichi's being a bum in his underwear until his homies pull up. Adachi says the Serayu clan's being suspicious. After old man Hoshino died in the last game, Takabe took over. But now he's in jail. But even though he's in jail, large numbers of Exikuza are gathering at Serayu, including the last guy Ichi tried to help. Ichi cannot stand by and watch some guy he barely knows get dragged back into the Yakuza, so he grabs his bat, blows his hair back out, and has more hallucinations about being a hero. Uh, yeah. They sneak into Serai HQ, beat the hell out of the clan, and find the Serai clan captain, Ebina. Ebina takes them to a storage warehouse specializing in controversial items or quote-unquote waste. However, it also provides jobs for the many ex Yakuza suffering from the five-year clause, including the guy Ichi came to see. Ebina also says they're planning the second great dissolution, or the dissolution of the remaining Yakuza groups, but they want to make sure there are enough jobs to go around first. Ebina claims he's continuing Arakawa's dream, Ichi's convinced, and then they're all leaving. But hold up, Captain Sawashiro? He killed Chairman Hoshino in the last game. The hell is he doing here? Well, not quite. Aoki had a hitman kill Hoshino, pinned it on Sawashiro, and now Sawashiro simply accepted his fate. His way of taking responsibility for the bullshit his son pulled in the last game. Ebina somehow knew the truth, got Sawashiro out of prison, and they are now working together to gather Exikuza under the Serayu and push forward the Second Great Dissolution. Later, Sawashiro has a favor to ask of Ichi. He wants Ichi to go to Hawaii to meet someone. His mother. Sawashiro confirms Ichi is really Arakawa and Akane's son, and drops some more background. Arakawa was originally in the Hikawa family, and the Patriarch wanted him to marry his daughter. Arakawa was like, sorry fam, I love Akane, to which the Patriarch said, fuck you, you can both die. Arakawa heard Hikawa hitman found Akane, say that ten times fast, so he single-handedly raids Hikawa HQ, fucks up all his boys, and tortures the Patriarch until he dies. Years passed until he got a tip that she was in Hawaii, he sent Sawashiro to find her, but to protect his own son, the young master, Sawashiro planned to kill her. <gasps> but didn't because it was obvious that Akane didn't want to be found. Sawashiro told Arakawa that Akane was dead and that was the end of it until recently. In prison, Sawashiro sent a letter to Akane telling her everything and now she wants to meet her son. He gives Ichi her address who agrees to go so he can give her Arakawa's ashes. After landing in Hawaii, Ichi helps his wheelchair guy get off the plane but then gets a gun pulled on him by his own taxi driver. Welcome to America! Taxi driver tries to rob our man but Ichi calls him out like, you won't, pussy! Rightfully so, Ichi kicks his ass, but don't forget, we're in America. Taxi guy calls the cops, starts playing the victim, and these idiots fall for it. Then this asshole eats Akane's address. Why? Ichi's been in Hawaii for an hour and is already getting arrested until wheelchair guy rolls up, literally. He tells the cops the truth and has video evidence, but taxi guy manages to run away because cops in these games are completely useless no matter what country they're from. Wheelchair guy was following Ichi because he thought taxi guy was sus. He wanted to make sure Ichi was good since he helped him while he was on the plane. Wheelchair guy's name is Eiji and offers to help Ichi get Akane's address from the video he took. They head back to his place to get the address, but then a gang pulls up with taxi guy, whose name is now Tomizawa. Leader of the gang walks in, Ichi's over here like, Dude looks like a modern day pirate. Which is funny because dude really looks like a Yakuza Jack Sparrow. You Captain, Captain Jack Sparrow. We'll just call him Yamai. Yamai wants revenge for Tomizawa, catches hands when Ichi knocks him out, and they get away. The two part ways and Ichi finally makes it to Akane's house. Nervous as all hell, he musters the courage to open the door and then finds this random girl who's not Akane. Her name is Chitose, is working as Akane's housekeeper. As she continues to serve drinks, things become increasingly suspicious until Ichi passes out. She drugged him? The next morning, Ichi's on the beach messed up like a frat boy in spring break, but ass naked. But I'm more concerned about how these blind tourists don't notice his little dragon hanging out until after he gets up. Fucking Chitose stripped this man clean and left his ass on the beach. 
Three days into a Hawaiian vacation, our man gets arrested. No ID, no passport, nothing. And because he's a John Doe, these crooked ass cops want to pin a six month old mugging on him. They're just as bad as the Japanese cops. And I mean that competent wise too, because Ichi manages to body both of them and runs out the front door and escapes in sandals and handcuffs. Then he gets stopped by some mystery guy and released? Kidu-san? Kidu's old ass is over here looking like Persona 4 is you, and when he starts talking, I immediately stop the game and change the voiceovers back to Japanese. He frees Ichi, gives him a ride, and says he's in Hawaii on a mission for the Daidoji faction. Kidu helps Ichi cop a fresh fit and does exactly what you'd expect after that. Take him to a bar. They need to get Ichi's passport back, so they head back to Akane's house and find out the person Kidu is looking for is also Akane. Interesting. What does the government spy ring want with Ichi's mom? Of course no one knows, but we can't figure that out now because Yamai's here. They try to slip out the back until Tomizana shows up with another gun. We all know he won't do it, but Ichi does the Ichi thing and makes a friend out of the guy who tried to rob him. Yamai pulls up like, stop being a pussy, shoot this bitch. Then Kiru does this Kiru inspirational speech thing causing Tomizawa to have a panic attack, turn around, and nearly blow Yamai's head clean off. But his Resident Evil ass doesn't even flinch, just checks the bullet hole and lets them escape after they whoop on Yamai's crew. Tomizawa says they too are after Akane, but doesn't know why. Who is this lady? Ichi's just trying to see his mom, and now the whole underworld's after her? They regroup at Kiru's hotel, realize Chitosi is their only lead, and pursue Ichi's passport to try and find her. Luckily, Tomizawa knows a guy who deals in black market passports. Jeff. My name is Jeff. They meet Jeff, whose fat ass looks like the personification of Banjo Tooie's Big Al, and he explains Chitose used the passport to buy entry into District 5, or Barracuda's home turf. The only way they're getting into District 5 is through a dirty cop named Roman, and of course, they find him at a bar. Roman's your typical asshole cop, tries to extort the homies, and then points a gun at them because America. He gets straight leveled by the dragon, agrees to wipe Ichi's charges and bring them to District 5. They head back to Kiryu's hotel, talk about fresh starts, and Kiryu's getting sentimental about living every moment to the fullest. You, uh, you good, Kiryu? I've got cancer. <gasps> no. And he has half a year left, at most. Three years earlier, Kiryu was working at a radioactive waste storage facility. Some random guy driving the forklift decided to have a heart attack, and Kiryu gets exposed trying to save him. Naturally, Ichi's freaking out, but Kiryu's already accepted his fate. Nothing else can be done. They get to District 5, Hawaii's version of Homeless Shawshank, get stopped by the gang, Roman gets gut like a fish, Damn! and the homies have to fight their way through until Kiryu's cancer picks the worst time to start acting up. They hide in a storage room, and oh shit, it's Chitose? Chitose says she was looking for her paycheck, and set Ichi up because she didn't want to get reported for trespassing. Chitose went to District 5 in an attempt to disappear as she doesn't want any of her actions to get out because she is the heiress to the very wealthy and powerful Fujinomiya family. Chitose found a data sheet on Akane because the Barracudas are looking for her too, got found snooping, and now she's running from the Barracudas because she's been burned in a traitor. They decide to partner up, Kiryu's magically feeling better, and the four of them fight their way to the Barracudas boss. They get to this nice ass penthouse and run into the leader of the Barracudas, Dwight. He's pissed Chitose betrayed him. Sorry, what? Chitose was being blackmailed to lead Ichi into a trap, but she didn't do it because he's the best boy. Of course, information needs to be beaten out of Dwight. Machete tries to gut our crew with dual machetes, but instead gets uppercut with a metal bullhead. Bodied. They're looking for Akane, but don't know why. The job came from an anonymous source. Akane is an orphanage director, so that's their next stop. But again, no one knows where she is. The orphanage is also part of Palakana, a Hawaiian religion that worships the volcano lady named Nele. The home is also here about Nele Island, a sacred land only accessible to the sage and his chosen. They help with some charity work by giving hands to the punks shaking down locals, and as fate would have it, the sage of Palakana appears. His name is Bryce. I call him Hawaiian Jesus. Hawaiian Jesus shows concern for Akane's disappearance, but doesn't have any useful information because no one does. During this conversation, Chitose disappears, she slipped away and is talking about earning Ichi's trust to some unknown caller. Is she playing him again? The group is out of leads and doesn't know how to find Akane, but what if she found them? Chitose suggests the most Gen Z shit ever by making a video, hoping it goes viral and Akane might be inclined to reach out to her son. Not the worst idea in the world with Ichi's charisma and thirst trap physique. They get the film they need and while Chitose is editing, Ichi helps a turtle demon in a cracked out Muppet build a 5 star island resort. The video gets uploaded and they get a DM from Eiji, the wheelchair homie. They meet up, Ichi fills them in on everything and Eiji offers to help. The reunion is interrupted by the punks that Ichi rocked the other day, but this time there's more. This time we find out they're part of the Ganja, Hawaii's Chinese Mafia. They want Ichi because they're looking for Akane too. Who 
is this woman? Because punks jump up to get beat down, the crew drops all 20 ganja, but when we head back to the hotel, it's fucking Yamai again. I guess every game has to have a Kuze. Yamai calls Kiryu out, who does the annoying who, me? thing he did all through Like a Dragon Gaiden, throws away his nice jacket, gets his ass beat because he can't take a hint, and leaves without his jacket. Since the hotel's been compromised, Kiryu takes everyone to the Daidoji hideout, where they meet Hanawa. Their next lead is the Ganja. Rumor has it that Nirvana Hotel owner Wong To is the Ganja official, and has the secret high roller casino that he frequents, but none of them could possibly get in, except maybe the heir to the Fujinomiya dynasty. Chitose pulls some strings, they go secret spy mode, and Kiryu reminds us all that he's still a man of culture. Kiryu son, what the hell are you doing? Just giving you a little change of scenery. To shows up and immediately knows who they are. Again, glasses aren't the best cover. To takes them to his office and attacks them when Ichi doesn't tell him what he wants to know. Unfortunately for him, he underestimates how hard-headed Ichi really is and gets dropped. To makes a last-ditch effort to escape, Kiryu's like, fuck that, and Ronaldo kicks a fucking desk chair straight into this man's back. Sit your ass down! Also, where did Tomi get a sword? To spills that his gang and the Barracudas were looking for Akane for someone called the Overseer, the person that rules the entire Hawaiian underworld. Like the Eugene 3, their Barracudas and Ganja are two sides of the same coin. Toe said too much, and his guard asserts his betrayal would not go unpunished. He gives the signal by jumping out the tower window and killing himself? The fuck is going on? The guy was an overseer spy, his death was the signal, and Toe says if they can get him to safety, he'll tell them everything he knows. The group does what they do best by punching everything, but Toe gets stabbed. They drag his maimed ass into the woods and give him a chance to rest while Tomi looks for a ride. The overseer has spies everywhere, even the police and gangs, and the lengths they'll go to for him are straight up cult level brainwashing. But who? Who has that kind of influence? Fucking Hawaiian Jesus! Holy shit! Wait. So the entire religion that Akane dedicated herself to is after her? Why? It's the girl that she's with, Lani. Bryce wants Lani dead because she could ruin his whole plan. Toe snitching because he wanted revenge since Bryce sent his mother's head to him in a box. What's in the box? We still don't know why Lani is important, but Akane is on the run to protect this 10 year old girl. With a ton of new information, there's no time to think because Yamai's looking for them with the same coat he left after the last fight. Yamai flushes them out, but the homies are able to fight back until Tomi rolls up with a car. Kiryu's cancer is acting up again, and he sacrifices himself if the others can get away. Now we need to go save Kiryu. Tomizawa might know where he is, and right when they need it most, Ichi gets a call from the Japan homies. They are bored, so they flew over to help. Adachi and Nama get caught up, they all head to Yamai's territory, beat the shit out of some goons who say Kiryu is in the theater building, where they beat the shit out of more goons until they find Yamai with body positive cabaret girls. As always, nothing useful said until you beat it out of them, so we're fighting Yamai. Again. After reminding Yamai to sit his ass down, they find Kiryu in a makeshift infirmary. Yamai told his people to take care of Kiryu because he once looked up to the dragon of Dojima. Yamai admits that he was only after Akane because everyone else was. Ichi fills him in, and he agrees to call off the hunt. Yakuza have more honor than preying on kids. Kiryu's back at the hideout and wakes up to a full-on intervention. You need to chill the fuck out, Kiryu. You're old as fuck, cancer as fuck, and have people that got your back now. Stop doing this lone wolf tough guy carrier ones burn bullshit that you've been doing for eight games. Surprisingly, Kiryu agrees, passes the torch off to Ichi and heads back to Japan with Nanba. Knowing the truth about Hawaiian Jesus, they go back to the orphanage, but something's off. Inside they find Bryce indoctrinating, I mean, teaching the orphan kids, teaching him how to be cult fucking psychopaths. He has to fight all of Bryce's fanatics and afterwards tells the orphanage workers what happened. They say many of the orphans there are chosen and sent to Nele Island. That's where they're likely groomed and sent back to infiltrate gangs, cops, even politics. Shout out to blind religious faith. Now we're Kiru. The doctor informs Namba Kiru's condition is getting worse, and his stubborn ass refuses to take it easy, like he's given up on fighting cancer and is rushing toward his death. Kiru's staying at Ichi's place, and Namba shows up with Sun He. They take a cancer patient out for a night in the town, including Cabaret Club, where they recruit Saiko for Operation Help Kiru Fight Cancer. They take Kiru to survive for karaoke. Unfortunately for me, I forgot to switch it back to Japanese, so when he says, I guess I just have a voice nobody wants to hear anymore. I couldn't agree more. While parting, Sun He gets a call, and Serayu clan are growing too fast, and something's up. Especially since the Serayu are moving their disposal business to Hawaii. This is sus. So they hit up Sawashiro for answers since he sent Ichi to Hawaii. He's at the new Serai HQ, the same location as the old Tojo HQ. 
They really will do anything to reuse assets, won't they? Ebina explains their waste disposal business is in a partnership with Pelicana. He needed Sour Shiro for the Second Great Dissolution, learned about Akane and Palakana through him, and dug deeper to learn about the waste management business. Palakana even has their own island where they run a waste disposal facility. Wait, now that island is being used for waste storage? And Ebina is sending Yakuza there to work the facility? But what about Ichi? Sour Shiro simply sent him to reunite with Akane, and Ebina claims they don't know about the Lani situation. Hmm. Eventually, Kiryu finally gets some rest, but when he wakes up, no way. The Tatara channel got him too? This fucking thirst trap VTuber tells 5 million subs his history with the Yakuza, how he faked his death, shows footage of him and Ichi, and has an interview with Ebina and Sawashiro as these two assholes confirm his identity and say he met with them wanting to resurrect the Tojo. What the fuck? The Daidoji are gonna be pissed. They head to the Serayu clan in Ijinsho, run into that degenerate who stole Atsuko's jacket, and Kiyu gives him one for all of us pissed off by his entitled bullshit. He calls in backup, fuck your backup, and they learn enough to assume Ebina and the Tatara channel are all connected. Now we're back in Hawaii, a few days prior as Kiryu and Namba are just arriving in Japan. Ichi's still looking for leads, and To suggests Akane's last known location, Yamai's territory. With no better option, they check it out, run into more Palakana inbreds, Yamai joins the fun, and they work together to clear them out. Yamai says, now get the fuck out of my hood. Ichi's all like, help us if you're real Yakuza. Get bent, Jufro. You just scared of Bryce. The fuck you say? Super fire crowbar power. And for the fifth time, we're fighting Yamai's gang. He really is Kuze. After throwing him on his ass for the millionth time, Yamai agrees to shelter Akane if she's found. And then they're approached by the resident old lady hardass. She takes them out in the middle of the ocean and... <gasps> Akane and Lani? Even though there are a thousand questions that need answers, Lani's safety is top priority, so Yamai secures transport to the Daidoji safe house, where they'll be transported to Japan. Despite the impending danger Akane and Lani are facing, Ichi decides to escort with the car window down. Never knowing her parents and with a deceased grandmother, Lani ended up in the orphanage where she met Akane, carrying the Palakana pendant and a will written by the then sage. Now that's pretty fucking interesting. Right? But if you haven't pieced it together yet, let me help. The will states Hawaiian Jesus is a false idol, and the true successor is Lani. Holy shit! Akane also mentions the last sage and his wife were killed in a robbery. Holy shit! You mean the very first scene of the game? Bryce stole the pendant, but his was fake. Bryce wants Lani dead because she could expose all of his corruption as this true sage. Holy shit! They get to the Daidoji safe house and Eiji is being sus. Shitose calls him out, saying he's been blackmailing her this whole time. I'm sorry, what? Then she flips his handicapped ass over and says he's a fake cripple. What? Eiji worked with Ebina and used the wheelchair bit to get close to Ichi as Shitose sees Dwight on FaceTime. What? Palakana thugs bust in and it's an all out brawl for Lani. Akana gets slapped, Hanawa and Toe get shot, dudes are throwing couches, it's fucking madness. When the dust settles, Lani and Eiji are gone. Akane is unconscious and Hanawa and Toe are dead. This is when Kiryu calls and as you can see, everything is fucked. Especially now that Eiji is connected to Ebina and Bryce. Ichi starts spiraling, Kiryu tells him to man the fuck up, but wait. What do you mean he was blackmailing you, Chitose? With the cops on the way, there's no time to truly explain. But what she does say is that she is Tatara. No fucking way. Eiji writes the scripts and she reads them, all under Ebina's orders. Ichi was sent to Hawaii in an effort to draw a Kanae for Bryce, and Eiji's been watching him since he got off the plane. What about Sawashiro? Ichi's convinced he's not in on it, so Kiryu tests his theory. After beating Sawashiro down, he begs Kiryu to get him out of there so he, they could speak freely. Bet. Sawashiro admits he sent Ichi to Hawaii before learning Ebina's second great dissolution is a front to bring in recruits. He's still committed to fulfilling Arakawa's dream, by seeing the second great dissolution through. He also believes the disposal business has something to do with nuclear waste. The same waste that gave Kiryu cancer as the web of connection grows more complicated. Bryce has been storing the world's nuclear waste on Nele Island for years, raking in massive profits. And now Ebina's getting a cut by sending Yakuza labor and brokering a deal between Japan and Palakana. Japan's corrupt elite want to start the nuclear industry to make more money, but the waste has been the biggest issue. Sending it to Nele Island is their solution. No waste in Japan equals public and legislative approval. Legislative approval means Ebina and Bryce are technically doing all this legally. On top of all this, Ebina has an ulterior motive that Sawashiro can't figure out. Back in Hawaii, Akane's still knocked out, but Shitose's gone. 
Is she going after Lonnie alone? As they search for her, they meet with the other Daidoji operatives and go over what they know. The Daidoji wanted Lonnie to stop the deal. They believe Palakana's plan would hurt the long-term prosperity of Japan, where the current government only cares about the short-term profit. They also profiled Eiji, who is a reporter that got fired after a hit and run. He claims he was set up by the Arakawa family. After being fired, Eiji joined Bleach Japan, and after that, he sides with Ebina. They get a text from Chitose, rush to the club she's at, fight their way in, and find Eiji's smug, partridge family haircut head ass chilling in the back. Chitose sneaks up, ready to blow his ego right out of his head. Lani's delivered, Chitose gets her arms sashimied, Eiji tries to get away and somehow gets her wheelchair up the stairs in the literal 15 seconds it took Eiji to catch up. Because Eiji is a sick fuck, he gives Lani a pipe bomb and pushes her down the stairs. You know it's intense for no reason other than the fact that this whole scene is in slow motion. Chitose saves Lani, but oh shit, Ichi misses the bomb. Adachi and Tomi just watch it fly by because they want to die apparently and boo! Wait, it's not a bomb? No, but it is tear gas. Chitose tries to save Lani but brings her straight to Eiji as he gets away. With Lani gone, they take some time to regroup, and Chitose finally explains why she's been fucking everything up since chapter 3 of this game. Four years ago, she started the Tatara channel to escape her overbearing controlled life. One year later, there was a Fujinomiya scandal that cost people their lives. Chitose's father tried to cover it up, but Chitose wanted to do the right thing by exposing the corruption on her channel. As a small streamer, no one cared until Eiji found her, turned Chitose's simple drawings into an anime wet dream, and fed her a provocative script. The video went viral and motivated by justice, the two operated Tatara jointly. They outed more corruption and the channel grew like crazy. But over time, Eiji's stories got wilder and targeted ex-Yakuza. Chitose wanted out, but Eiji said he would reveal her identity if she left. So she forced herself to read the next script, Ichi's smear campaign. Because he's the best boy, Ichi forgives her. Group morale restored, they head back to Yamai's, but now his own people are trying to bust the door down. Dwight pulled a godfather, made an offer they couldn't refuse, and Yamai's people turned. And during all this, we finally learn Eiji's motivation is to make all Yakuza suffer. Ebina will somehow make that happen once they get the girl. Ichi's like, fuck that, and kicks some traitor ass, but there's too many. They can't get through. Say less, as they beat down two backholes into submission, commandeer one, and dukes of hazard that shit across the street and into Yamai's hideout. We won't talk about how they all just got up unharmed. They suplex their way through the rest of the traders and quell the uprising. Ichi's in a rush to save Lani, but Yamai tells them to take a minute. Meet your mother before you get yourself killed. What do you even say to the woman who stuffed your newborn ass in a locker? Well, in a heartfelt scene, Ichi thanks Akane for getting knocked up. He wouldn't be here without her. He gives her Arakawa's ashes, they are completely overwhelmed with emotion, and we're back to Kiru. Sawashiro needs help to see the second great dissolution through and begs Kiru to assemble the Yakuza's Mount Rushmore. The OG legends themselves, Daigo, Taiga, and Majima. <laughs> they went into hiding and Kiru's the only one that can drag them back out. They hitchhike their way to this raggedy ass shack and the once proud legends must have fallen hard because now they all look homeless. Homeless Daigo explains after the dissolution they formed a security company to help ex-Yakuza survive the five-year clause, and everything was going great at first. Then the fucking Satara channel started running stories about the company any scandal could get their fake hentai hands on. Clients pulled out, and as things fell apart, the Yakuza life started calling back to Daigo's employees. They heard about Ebina, did a background check, and learned Ebina's not his real name. He changed it after his mother died. He's really Hikawa. Holy shit! Don't get it? Let me explain. Ebina's mother is the daughter of the Hikawa family patriarch, the same patriarch that pressured Arakawa to marry his daughter, and tried to kill Arakawa and Akane when Arakawa broke off the engagement. However, before Arakawa said no, he tapped that and knocked her up, but didn't know a bun was in the oven when he single-handedly murdered her father and the entire clan. That means that Ebina is Arakawa's kid. That means that Ebina is Ichi's half-brother. Holy shit! It stands to reason Ebi is not a fan of the Yakuza, explaining his relationship with Eiji, but why go through all the trouble of leading the Serayu in the waste disposal plan? Kiru then shares Sawashiro's request. Finish what you started and help me see this through. Daigo's depressed ass is all like, there's nothing we can do. Then your homeless asses can keep your excuses and rot. You better check yourself, Kiru. Get your bitch hands off me. Majima starts throwing knives, Kiyu's people are ready to throw hands, and here it is, a full-on brawl with three of the most legendary Yakuza this franchise has ever seen. Kiru gives them his famous post-fight hero speech and walks off like the badass he is. 
As they're getting back to Ijincho, Tatara starts spreading more fake news. The guy who Kiru hitchhiked with got film of the recent meeting, and Big Teddy Tabloid over here is convincing everyone he's really trying to resurrect the Tojo. In a later livestream, Ebina announces the Serayu and Japanese government's plan to dispose nuclear waste on Nele Island, and how they're using Serayu clan members as labor. But wait a second, they're not Serayu clan members anymore. Ebina just dissolved the Serayu into Bleach Japan. They're back? Still trying to find a way to Nele Island, Ichi and the homies get jumped by cultists and end up hiding at a local shrine. Even though we're in the second to last chapter, RGG throws another playable character at us as Jungi Han randomly shows up for basically no reason. The Gomi Jewel got their swordfish on, hacked a government satellite, and now know the location of Nele Island and a cargo ship used to transport supplies from the mainland. This could have easily been sent in an email five chapters ago. They go back to the homeless Shawshank and body the entire Barracuda gang as they fight their way toward the hidden dock. They find Dwight and Lonnie, he threatens the killer, Little Fish has some bite, and Ichi's crew remind him he ain't shit. Dwight then grabs a noob tube, but forgets rule number one. Aim at the feet. Boom! Everything is exploding. Boom! Including Dwight's face. Lonnie and Akane are reunited, but with Palakana spice everywhere, they have no idea how to get to Japan. Because Yamai's the homie now, he has an idea. Yamai randomly has this tugboat, so they take that until they get picked up by a Japanese Coast Guard. But first, Dwight's dumbass is back because no one can take a hint in this damn game. But this time, oh shit, Bruce is out here eating people? Dwight gets beat down again and tries to escape, but when they said fish are friends, not food, I guess they forgot about barracudas. They get to the Japanese Coast Guard and Date's waiting for them. Yamai is turning himself in for the murder he committed and in return demanded safe harbor for each and his people. Now the media is running the fake Kiryu story and all of Japan is against our people. Luckily, the chief of Injincho's homeless camp is still on their side as offers them temporary shelter. Trying to figure out a plan, Ichi gets a call from Ebina? He's baiting Ichi with Sawashiro and wants to meet tomorrow night. And I'll give you one guess where he's at. Fucking Millennium Tower. Real talk. At this point, the biggest plot twist RGG could ever do in any of these games is not have the final boss fight at Millennium Tower. To make things worse, Bleach Japan and the Nuclear Disposal Project has been approved by the Japanese government, and they'll start shipping waste and Serayu to Nele Island tomorrow. With religious protections, Nele Island is essentially a black box. Once the Serayu members get there, they'll be Palakana slaves, dumping waste for the rest of their lives. With two problems in two different places, Kiryu and Ichi step aside to figure things out. Kiryu's motivated to go after Ebina. He feels responsible for not changing the Yakuza when he was chairman of the Tojo and wants to make up for it. Everything else will be left to Ichi as he'll go to Hawaii. Kiryu will take care of the Yakuza's past while Ichi's responsible for his future. Shit is deep. Ichi then gives Kiryu his own hero speech telling Kiryu not to throw his life away. Then the Daidoji rep shows up at the camp. They're pissed Kiryu's identity got out, but please they secured Lani. After everyone falls asleep, Chitose sneaks off. The hell is she up to now? The next morning, shit gets real. Kiryu fixes his hair and puts on the most conic suit in gaming. That's right, I said it. The Kiryu we know and love is fucking back. A little older and grayer, but he's fucking back. Ichi and the Hawaii homies head out to Nele Island, but of course it never goes as planned because fucking Jaws jumps on the boat trying to eat all their asses. They manage to fight off a shark bigger than the damn boat itself, find Nele Island, knock out a bunch of banana soup brines, it's peanut butter jelly time. and somehow get into a fight with COVID blooper. Yo, get this man a tissue. Eventually they make it to Bryce and his nasty ass garbage dump full of nuclear waste. Bryce starts spewing more cold bullshit, even blaming his own faithful for following him. And if that doesn't make sense, we won't even get into the fact that he's been sage for over 70 years. Hawaiian Jesus? Nah. Now we're fighting the cult crib keeper. As with any bad guy who monologues too much, Bryce says Nele Island was his goal the whole time, where countries can easily dump their secrets. This provides Bryce a nice profit, but also leverage and influence over the world's elite. The previous age wanted to sell the island, which forced Bryce to kill him and take over. No more talking, as Ichi rips off his suit and lets everyone know it's about to go back. Bryce sends guards with swords and Uzis, sit your ass down. Desperate to stop Ichi, Bryce invokes the holy power of 9mm, but Ichi smites 9 blasphemy when he decks him in his heathen ass face. Ass kicked, Bryce still thinks he's untouchable. Too many countries are involved in this scandal. They won't let it get out. Until... Chitose finally uses her channel for good, exposing the entire dump on the Tatara channel. She even put Bleach Japan, Bryce, and the Fujinomiya group on blast. When Chitose snuck out the night before, she confronted her father and convinced him to come clean. 
Speaking of, Chitose then decides to expose herself, telling her entire following the truth about Satara's corruption. Bryce makes one last effort to go out like a bitch, but Ichi's like, fuck that, grabs dude's foot and straight up strongman keg tosses this 90 year old dude 20 feet into the air. Old man has to be all kinds of broken right now, trade that pendant in for a damn life alert. Now it's Kiryu's turn as he and the homies head for Millennium Tower. Of course there are Serayu everywhere, but Kiryu has had enough of this bullshit. He goes off like all you franchise OGs when he first played like a dragon. Fuck this turn-based combat! Hands, 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 hands! And don't forget, no Millennium Tower raid is complete without a helicopter, so here you go. The crew's completely pinned down until no way. The OG legends are here? Taiga can't shoot a rocket to save his life, but at least they can still fight as we are treated to one of the baddest scenes in the entire game. Kiryu's dropping people like he's not old as dirt and has cancer. Daigo's trying to stay relevant because let's be real, no one really cares about him that much. Taiga's tossing dudes by their faces again, and Majima's crazy ass is out for more blood. All the old fans are losing their minds, and you new fans better fucking recognize. Shit is crazy. The homies continue to fight their way to the top of the tower, as Kiryu reminds us how he never kills anyone. And finally, they make it to Ebina. Sawashiro has clearly seen better days as Ebina describes the burden the Hikawa family's destruction put on him and his mother, and his seething hatred for Arakawa. Arakawa's death ruined Ebina's chance for revenge, but that just meant he would have to get revenge on the collective group. He gathered displaced Yakuza and planned to send them all to Nele Island to live out their lives doing radioactive slave labor. After some more monologuing, Ebina ruins a perfectly good suit by ripping it off. Shout out to Kiryu's tailor because he's been doing this since the 80s, and RGG legit forgot to age Kiryu from the neck down. For real, he's 55 with cancer. Who looks like that? Regardless, it is finally here. The last battle. They straight beat the shit at each other, Rocky style. Ebina thinks he's smooth with that sword. Fuck your sword. And then Q catches a man with the SHROYUKEN! A beat up Ebina calls Kiryu out like, Kill me, or I'll keep coming back. A normal person would end it right there. Fuck this guy. But remember, Kiryu doesn't kill. Instead, his wise old self empathizes with Ebina, begs him for forgiveness, and asks him to give the Yakuza a chance to change. Then he passes out. No! Kiryu! Wake up! Ichi's back in Japan, finds a messed up Eiji, and uses the power of friendship to convince Eiji to turn himself in. While Ichi's carrying Eiji to the police station, Kiryu's getting airlifted to the hospital. Credits. No, screw your credits. A month later, the gang's chill not survive. Eiji, Ebina, and Bryce have all but vanished because now the world has the attention span of a goldfish. Shout out to social media. Lani is the new sage of Palakana, but we'll have Akane and Tomizawa to help out as she rebuilds. Chitose finally becomes the Fujinomi a chairwoman and is cleaning up her family's mess. Ichi finally drops the L word and tells Saiko how he really feels. She seems happy but doesn't say it back. But it's not like Ichi really gave her a chance because he immediately makes another dumbass move causing Saiko to storm off. Now we're at the hospital and no, is that really Haruka and Haruto? With a renewed determination to live, Kiru decides to fight his cancer. It probably helps that he got his name and his true identity back. But let's be real, Kiru's not going anywhere. RGG will probably Futurama this man before they let him die. 